Welcome to A Game of Ice and Fire, a video series devoted to A Song of Ice and Fire war game by Cool Me or Not. We cover all aspects of the hobby with tactics and list build videos, painting tutorials of varying levels, and battle reports. In today's video we're going to be painting the Cave Dweller Savages from the Free Folk Army. And they just dropped recently and the sculpts on these are pretty legit. Uh, I currently own four units, so I'm going to be going over some of the tactics I use that uh, help me paint these quickly without having to think a whole lot, and we're really just aiming for getting them painted and on the table right away. We're not trying to do anything too fancy, although maybe towards the end we might be getting a little fancy. So first off, this is just one unit that I'm setting out in front of me. It has three unique sculpts plus a fourth one for the Cave Dweller Alpha. So what I'm going to do is separate these into groups based on what color I want to paint first. And it's going to be the fur on these ones. Uh, the fur is a little bit more haphazard in how I would paint it to do, to do it quickly. So I'm just pulling out three different sets of paints for like a base, a highlight, and uh, a medium, well, medium tone and then a highlight too. So since I've only got three sets, I'm just going to have one repeat for each one. Normally, I will, uh, normally I'll, I'll have uh, um, four different ones so I can do all the sculpts kind of, they, they kind of all have, they don't have a repeating one in them, but uh, I'm starting off the base coats on these with the airbrush. There's going to be a lot of airbrushing in this one just because it's fast and that's how I want to go about it. I think someday in the future I will maybe go over a tutorial on how to use aerosol cans as you would an airbrush just to help you out if you're not um, if you're not taking a plunge on an airbrush or you don't have one to use. So we started off with the brown on that first set, and this this one is uh, we're starting off from a black base coat to this peanut brown or peanut butter brown. It's just peanut butter from Scale Game Color, and this is not a very strong paint, so I can't lay lay it down in one shot and get what I want out of it. So I think I end up doing this about three times to get a nice strong color. Uh, if I were trying to not move so quickly through these, uh, I probably would have based it or primed it in a different color to try and build that up. But I can just sit here and throw that color on a few times. You can see now with the time lapse that there's uh, they're pretty bright now. And then this is uh, just the black primer, but to highlight it, I find that black is not very, it doesn't look very good if you're just highlighting it with like a gray or a white. So I'm using more of like a purplish gray color here. And this is a uh, uh, Lendanus gray from Scale Color. A lot of this is all Scale Color right now because I just, I really enjoy the series of paint and just picked it up recently. Uh, so with that uh, Lenandis gray, I did have to mix in a little bit of a black color to, or a little bit of black to it because it wasn't just a, a little too much of a highlight. It wasn't a nice transition. So now I'm going over the uh, Arbuckle Brown that I had laid down first and highlighting with Bosch Chestnut, all from Scale Game Color. And uh, the progression here is pretty nice. Uh, I think that depending on how you look at it, when we finish up with these, you could see that maybe some of these highlights get lost a little bit just based on what we do. But I think that this process definitely makes it look a little bit better in the end. So you can kind of alter it however you want to. The final highlight for the black uh, unit is going to be Miskatonic Gray, or it might even just be Lenandis Gray, or Len Lendanus Gray, sorry. Um, just straight. I think that's probably what it is because the Miskatonic gray looks a little more creamy. And then for the final highlight on the brown part of the unit, we used Kokum Copper. And that color goes on pretty nice. The The progression from these colors works out pretty smoothly. I don't have to go over it too much. I do have to hit these twice just to make sure I'm really establishing that highlight because we're going to dull it down a little bit in a moment here. With the white unit, or like the, I, I would call it like the polar bear type unit. Um, I'm highlighting with uh, high key yellow. And that's just kind of more of like the bone color for the scale, uh, the scale game color line. 
And then uh, this one goes on pretty well over the uh, uh, peanut butter brown. Um, this one, I, what we end up doing to it ends up making it look a lot like everything we do here is going to really dim these down a little bit. So we're not painting the Cave Dweller Savages to have like this really super clean, fresh looking or freshly laundered looking fur that they're wearing so just uh it's gonna be a process and it'll come around soon but you can see just within the first you know 15 20 minutes i'm getting these uh colors down so when i amplify this across you know three more units and try to do them all at once you can really save yourself a ton of time on these so airbrushing if you're painting a free folk army is super helpful the last color is just purity white from the scale color line. You can use basically whatever white you would want to. I don't think any one... Well, I, there are some whites out there that are real trash, but um, this one's pretty decent. So here's the final look of the three different types of units, or three different uh, models we did. You can see they're still pretty bright, but what we've done when we, when we do this type of like zenital eye or airbrushing, we kind of lose some of the details. So I'm picking out like kind of what I would consider the holy trinity of washes where you uh, have your null and oil for black, your Agrax Earthshade for brown, and then your uh, Seraphim Sepia, all from GW, uh, to do the, uh, the washes on the fur. And I'm not being really careful with this. I'm, I don't want it to just be tinted over. I do want the wash to seep into the crevices on these. Uh, you could cut this a little bit with some flow aid to make sure that it goes all the way in and doesn't like sit on the top and kind of pool up a little bit. But when you thin your washes with uh, flow aid, um, when it dries, it can kind of have this film if you over mix it. So be careful, be mindful of that. On these uh, white ones, the Seraphim Sepia is going to do a really good job of making the fur kind of look dirty and gritty instead of really like fresh and white uh, I could see maybe doing the alpha with a little bit more of a bright white color but the uh, we're really just wanting to pick out the details on the fur through the wash and you could do this just by painting it a solid color and dry brushing it from there but with the airbrushing I get a little bit better of a transition and uh, the wash is really quick and I get enough time between rolling through these if I'm doing them all at once to where by the time I'm ready, by the time I finish the wash on the last one, I'm ready to dry brush. So now that we've washed, there's another thing that we've done. And uh, other than establish the shadows, we've kind of tinted over the main color that we wanted for a highlight. So we lost a little bit of that. So this is where we bring in the dry brush. And if you're not, if you're new to painting miniatures, Dry brushing is just using one of these like big flat brushes. They work kind of the best, um, but there are smaller ones that you can use. It's just whatever you feel comfortable with. And it's just taking your paint. In this case, it's going to be that Linandus gray for the black ones. And you get that on your brush pretty liberally. And then you just really dig that into your uh, paper towel. I mean, you don't have to beat your brush up. But what you're trying to do is dry the paint-ish on your brush. And then you're going to be flicking it back and forth so that the dry paint catches on the raised edges. And since you've dried it down a little bit, the paint isn't going to wipe or streak across the model like you would think it would. You're, we're really just uh, trying to get the edges of the fur. And this is why I started with doing the colors for the fur first. Because this way I don't have to worry about being mindful of the skin tones or the weapons or the leather parts that I paint. I can just do the fur all at once because it's the most haphazard thing to paint. And then this is kind of the end result of what dry brushing will get us on that one. So now I think we move on to the the brown model that we've painted. And we're just grabbing that Kokum Copper that we had highlighted the model with. And uh, Agrax Earthshade has a really uh good and both good and bad issue or characteristic to it where it just kind of really tints everything super hard like it's really thick wash um not quite as thick as 
GW's old Devlin mud used to be, but it's still pretty intense. So we do want to try and reestablish that brown highlight that we had put on the model. And uh, so I get a little bit more heavy handed with the, uh, the highlights on this one. Um, you could probably calm down the dry brushing a little bit just to make sure that some of your airbrushing has uh, remained so you don't lose those transitions. But I don't really think we do so much with this. It's just a little bit more subtle. And the last one, I tried to, uh, I tried to just do the white or pure white on this one with the other brush, but I had to switch to one of my smaller ones because I, you can't, when you're dry brushing, you can't really wash your brush and then use it right away. Your brush has to be dry in order for it to do this. So you can see on the white one, we're still leaving behind some of that gritty seraphim sepia color in the mo in the model's recesses, and just not being super. Uh, attentive with trying to make sure that the the top coat of their fur becomes white all over again. The Free Folk models in general are pretty busy, so anything you can do to save yourself some time with painting them is a huge bonus because you will be painting a lot of these. Nowhere, ne nowhere near would I suggest that someone needs to buy four units of these. I've just played a couple lists that have four units and I enjoy it, but I think two is really safe and three is probably more what you'll want to end up with in the grand scheme of things, but um, I wouldn't say that having four is beyond reasonable. So these are the three scale color, scale game color uh, paints that I really like for painting a more darker uh, flesh tone. And we start out with Tindalo spread and Resurrection flesh, flesh or Harvester flesh. I can't remember which one it which one is the darker one? Resurrection flesh, flesh is the darker one. And I'm just going to go over and uh, I do like a one part Tindalos red, two parts Resurrection flesh, and uh, go over the model. So like with the Cave Dweller Savages, they are exposed to the elements quite a bit. And they also uh, do go out hunting. So I don't know if you would say like they go out hunting during the day. I would imagine they're more like night stalkers or something like that. And I'm not trying to get too like, uh, you know, lower crazy or fluffy on these ones. But I do want the skin tones to kind of match the areas that they would come from because I feel like it's it's important to me at least that I have my models look the way I think they should look. And uh, having that more red, like weather beaten skin tone is more important to me than having a really pale skin tone because they're you know cave dwellers i imagine they don't spend their entire lives in caves and even if you're out only in the night you're still going to get beat by the weather i mean i just like the idea of having a more reddish skin tone so i'm not going to be traveling too far away um in the highlight area to get them to be a really uh um bright pale skin tone but uh I have decided to name this model Creepy Carl. Uh, it, I don't know why, it just kind of spoke to me when I saw it. This is probably my favorite model in the box. I just, I'm not sure why, it just kind of looks really nutty. And uh, I figured it needed a name as the the first one that got finished. But the we do have to go over with the, the Tindalos Red and Harvest or Resurrection flesh, flesh mix a couple times because the white is still kind of showing through some of the color that we have, or the color that we put down. So now instead of going straight to Resurrection Flesh, I want the transition to be a little bit more smooth. And like I said earlier, I don't want to um, make this look really pale. So I mix in a couple drops of the uh, the Tindalos Red Heart or Resurrection Flesh Flesh mix, and we start highlighting. And the my thought pattern on this is. I'm really just catching the, uh, I'm, I'm not catching, I'm leaving behind only the deepest lines on their muscle tone. Now these, these savages, they are very defined. They're quite muscular. Uh, they almost kind of look uh, muscularly emaciated, if that's kind of a term I can use. You know, like they're, they're, they're scrawny, but they've got some, some girth to them in terms of muscle tone and definition. So there's a lot of curves and cool raises in their skin that you can paint over to make them look really uh, unique. So 
um, definitely you can do as you wish in terms of how you want to highlight these. <laughs> but I think that uh, just using a smaller tip brush, like I'm, this is a, uh, oh, what? I think this comes from Dick Blick and it's uh, the Master Stroke series. The, their their finest something finest red sable I think is what they call it. So these brushes are relatively cheap, and uh, they work pretty well. I mean, when it comes to just beating them up and uh, moving on once they've kind of run their course, I do wash my brushes probably twice a week. Um, I'm not super great with washing them after I use them. Maybe on some of my more like high valued brushes, I will wash them after every use, but uh, these Master Stroke ones, they're less than six bucks, I think, a piece, and they're really, they get a lot of work done for the price. So if you're looking for a good brush that is not expensive, I would definitely look at Dick Blick, and they, they have an online store, so you don't have to go to any um, physical locations, but uh, just pay attention to the... <laughs> <laughs> to the type you're getting. I have a friend who uh, I bought him some brushes as a thank you for picking me something up and uh, the brush handles were twice the size of what they normally were so it was uh, it was quite comical but um, I definitely pay attention to what you're doing because I was I was not so going into the store sometimes is a little bit better. So we're still just hitting highlights on this one. I'm there's not a whole lot of method to this. I'm not trying to feather out or um, layer in a way that deposits paint in the way that you would if you were doing a, a more like classy paint job. I really am just slamming color down. I'm not trying to get really techy with this. So now we're going in with just straight resurrection flesh. This is going to be what I had thought was going to be the final highlight for the model. Um, but we're really just now, instead of, we're just hitting the parts where light would hit the model the most. And I know that it's really cliched, but I kind of have the, in all of my tabletop painting, the world, in the world, it's always high noon. Because uh, it's kind of the easiest way to highlight them. And if someone was looking at them straight on, they kind of get to see a lot of that variation. On the table, it doesn't quite come across the right way because everybody's looking down on them but it's still a probably my preferred way to go about painting i think it's it's high noon everywhere in the wargaming world um so we're just hitting some of the very high points that would be hit by the light from that straight up and down angle on his arm here there are a few spots where i elected to not put or not leave any of the dark paint in the recesses because i knew with his arm out like that it would catch a lot of the light and I know that this all sounds really tedious for some tabletop models that I'm just trying to paint like assembly line style, but the uh, it really isn't too difficult to do. And if you wanted to speed this up, you really could just use um, a mix that I enjoy for flesh tone washing is uh, GW's Purple Wash. I can't remember what it's called, um, but mix that with Reichlin Flesh. And then you can get that good, like, reddish-purple wash. Because I think Reichland Flesh on its own isn't very good. Um, so it's uh, you could just paint it the, the Harvester or Resurrection Flesh color and uh, then wash it and be done if you wanted to. But now I'm going in with a little bit more delicate highlight. And this is a Resurrection Flesh mixed with Harvester Flesh. And it's just to get a few points where I think there's just some really high definition that I want to catch. Um, the Cave Dweller Savages are probably one of the better looking models that they've put out in a while. So I just want to give a little bit of attention to the first unit that I paint. And honestly, I'm probably going to paint all of them like this because I really do enjoy painting flesh tones. So there's the finished flesh for the Savage. And now I'm laying down um, the main color that I use for my Free Folk if you ever get a chance to see my raiders on the channel, um, they are all one color. I mean, like, not that they're all one color painted, but they all, they don't have, like, that varied leathers or anything like that. They're all just this straight, like, kind of camo brown, icky brown. Like, if you're a 40K player, like, think of, like, Nurgle-style brown. I really like the color that Cool Knots associated with them, with that kind of, like, 
greenish brown. So I use that as the color to tie everything in because I do like uniformity in my armies. And uh, putting just a, every leather spot on this model is getting that paint color. And it's uh, it's this paint, and, and I kind of used a sample bottle that I had because it was, I don't, I don't traffic in greens very much. So it's some reaper green mixed with uh, um, beastie brown from uh, Vallejo and then highlighted with uh, that reaper green plus uh, leather brown from Vallejo. Um, here, I believe I'm trying to make the, uh, the hair color. And for Creepy Carl, we've decided to give him some more auburn red hair. And I think that... Um, I could do a whole tutorial on hair colors because there's so many variations on what you can do with hair, especially just for the red hair color. And what I've done is mixed the Vallejo um, Marion Brown, I think it's what it is what it's called. And uh, it's a real dark brown, like almost black brown. And I've mixed that with Reaper's Gory Red, uh, which is one of my staple reds. I highly recommend it if you're having trouble with reds. But I mix those two together to lay the base tone down or base coat down for the hair. And it doesn't really stand out a whole bunch on this model, but we're going to be highlighting it up quite a few times in order to make that hair stand out. I am not getting super intense with the strands because on this model they do differentiate the strands of the hair pretty well. But I'm not going to go that deep into making sure that you can see all the little hair parts picked out. So I'm kind of doing like a ham-fisted highlight of uh, some orange from Vallejo game color that I don't like, but I use it because I have it, and I can't remember the name of it. It might be Blaze Orange or something like that. Um, oranges are really tough to find. <laughs> I mean, like, good ones are tough to find. Like, even the scale color oranges, I can't say I'm a super huge fan of. Um, orange is just one of those colors where you almost have to find one to mix in with other colors to build up to like this is the people want to talk about complaining about painting red or white it's orange is the pain in the butt um, because you always have to kind of highlight up to the color you want and it's really difficult to paint it the straight color that you want now I've done it with some dry pigments and stuff like that before from Hera um, but with uh, a song of ice and fire I decided to stay away from some of those bombastic colors so I've just kept going back and forth and adding more and more orange to the the mix, and it's kind of given me this nice little, like, not overtly comical red hair, but red enough. And now I'm going through and highlighting the base color that I put down with the, uh, the brown earlier, um, or that greenish brown. I think I also skipped the part where I washed it with uh, Devlin mud again. Um, it's just, it gives it some more definition and pulls it more away from green and more into brown so we're just establishing the highlights that we wiped away with the washes which is really what I think the best wash process is is you do your base coat you wash and then you highlight and then that's pretty much good enough to get it done and move on to the next piece and here I'm just uh, taking care of some of the weird um, brown leather straps that are hanging out there's not a ton of them so there, it's just something if you're paying attention to the the model, you notice them hanging out here. And I also take the opportunity to hit the um, to hit the weapon handle with that beastie brown from Vallejo. I think now we're just going over and uh, oh, we're hitting the the black parts. So I decided to do uh, black leather wrappings on the uh, handled weapon. I just I. The brown is starting to get a little overwhelming on this model with the brown hair color, the brown uh, weapon handle, the brown and the leather on them. So I wanted to try and break it up a little bit by putting a few more black parts on him. And uh, ultimately, I believe I also switched the... I was originally going to do the weapon parts in uh, bone, but I decided to do them in black to make it look more stone. And I believe that's what I'm going to do with all of the... Uh, cave dwellers that have this white fur on them is they're all just going to have that to create some contrast because there's not a whole lot here and uh, my my models are also going to be based heavily in snow because I figure the further up north you are the more snow there is on the ground so there's not going to be a whole lot of opportunity to contrast within 
um, within the basing scheme. I mean, I could probably stick some rocks in there or something, but again, I've got, you know, 40 some models to do and uh, I'm not about doing custom bases for all 40 of them. I, I just want to get them painted on the table and and going on. Maybe the Baratheons will get a special treatment paint job and just be gorgeous, but right now the free folk are getting done dirty. So we I, here's where we wash the model in Devlin mud and uh, I think we've got to get to the dry brushing now. No, we're highlighting the black and this is using that Lin, Lindanis gray again or purple. Um, it's a fun color. I I think I'll, there's even a whole tutorial I could do on painting the color black because there's a hundred ways to do it. Um, you can see I'm picking stuff off. This this dry brush is about at the end of its life cycle. So when I'm dry brushing with my mix of, um, I'm using Hawk Turquoise from GW. They don't make it anymore, but it is one of my favorite turquoise. And I just had a whole stockpile of it when they switched over to the new colors. So, um that one. I think there's a... F Army Painter makes a good turquoise. I think it's like Hydra Turquoise or something. That's a good replacement for it. Um, but I mix that with Wolf Gray and uh, from Vallejo Game Color, and that gives you a nice little highlight for this stone. And I just dry brushed the the little pickaxe part because it's, uh, again, there are a lot of ways to paint uh, the color black, and that's one of them is by using teal. And after sitting on this model for a little while, I wasn't really happy with the way that the hair was looking. It didn't stand out enough, so I decided to really pour some more orange on with that brown that I was mixing up to just make uh, make his hair stand out a little bit more because it was kind of getting lost in the, the reds on the skin tone, and then it just wasn't standing out for me. So I went ahead and upped the game on that. And here I'm just hitting the little bone necklace that he has. He's got a few... Of all the, I thought there was going to be a ton of bones on these models, but there wasn't. So I just hit the necklace quick. So, um, I used to be a tattoo artist, and then I moved, moved on a different direction in my life. And since I'm a miniature painter, one of the things I always get asked is, how do you paint tattoos? And uh, for the cave dwellers, I wanted to make sure I did their markings, like, I wanted to make them look... Act, like neat and somewhat realistic and uh, I decided to translate I mean whether you dye your skin or tattoo your skin you kind of get the same effect not that's com that's probably a little bit on the like mi I'm minimalizing it a little bit there but what I'm trying to get at is whether this model's got tattoos or dye on it in shapes so what I'm doing is taking blue and red for those shapes just so I don't uh I wanted blue to break up the model a little bit and stand out, and then the red just kind of put on there to go with the colors. I didn't want them to just be blue. You know, I didn't want this to reenact Braveheart. So the best way to paint tattoos on models or dyed skin is to take the color that you want to use and then mix in the skin tone, the base of the skin tone that you were using. So I would not call the Tindalos Red plus Resurrection Flesh mix the, the base. I would just use straight resurrection flesh, and I'm being very mindful and precise about trying to not paint super wiggly lines here, but I get one down the face, and I'm trying to match a lot of these more tribal shapes that you might see. Um, I know that uh, First Men, it seems like their tattoos were more, they served more of a purpose for um, healing more than anything. So we're really just trying to do some really simplistic, like, fun shapes on this model, a couple armbands of varying thicknesses, and uh, this first pass is going to be just the the blue that I used, which is, uh, I think this is Aryan Hod blue. I don't, I'm not sure exactly where Scale 7.5 gets some of their names for these colors, but that's, uh, that's the one that I picked up, I guess. Um, and we're, now we're going to go back with the, uh, this is resurrection flesh now, or no, harvester flesh, the higher one. And now I want to dull the, the blue down. I want more of a mix between, uh, a faded skin tone and the blue color. And this is kind of what we're, it's not so much that we're highlighting the tattoos with this. It's more so that the pieces that are exposed to more, uh, 
that are exposed to the elements more are going to be the more faded parts. So we want to try and match some of those skin tone, but only with a little trace of the, uh, the tattoo color that we're leaving behind. So if you pay attention to my fingers, uh, they've got words on them. Those words used to be mint green, <laughs> but now they are just flesh tone-ish with a little bit of green left over. Because your fingers, they the skin's hard. It's, a, it's exposed to a lot of beat. Um, the, the ink doesn't really stay in very well and your body just kind of works it out over the healing process. So when I get to the parts of the forearms on this model, I want to dull down those colors a lot more because I, I you know, I'm not trying to be super accurate, but I want to be somewhat at least true to what the, what is actually going on on his body. And if this were dyed, it would be the same thing. So you would lose those colors. The next color that I'm going with is Mayhem Red uh, from Scale Color, or Scale Game Color. And that one, it, this one's a tough one to negotiate because I have a little bit more of a reddish skin tone. So I don't want to go too hard on mixing red, but in the universe of tattooing, red is a little bit more of a tough color to get to stick in when it's on a part that, of someone's body that takes a lot of, uh, a lot of damage. Uh, which is where most of this is going to be because this guy's body's mostly uncovered. So some of these are just more like, it's really hard to find the balance between um, tattoos and scars when you're painting the color red on a model, especially with this kind of skin tone. So I'm just doing the best I can to try to avoid painting the exact skin tone. So now I've got, this is looking more like that Tindalos red mix that we had before, but it's just really mixing the the resurrection flesh in with the red, and I'm being very sparse with it. Uh, I don't want to do it so much to where it looks like just skin. So there's the finished model. I've got the basing down on it. Lots of snow, like I said. Um, if you want a snow tutorial, I would check out Secret Weapon Miniatures. They've got a great one. And here's just a couple stills. I hope that these might show you what the model looks like finished a little bit better than what the camera can. But my camera taking capabilities and skills are not as good as I wish they were. But this should give you a quick paint for Savages. And uh, they are a pretty legit model, both uh, sculpt-wise and rules on the table. I think that the Cave Dweller Savages really change a lot for the Free Folk. And I look forward to discussing more of that in future tactics discussion videos or podcasts. So if you have any uh, questions, you can leave them in the comments below. And make sure to check us out on Facebook. I'll leave a link in the description. And I will also leave a description or a link in the description to the podcast that I'm taking or that I'm running with right now. Uh, otherwise, I hope you enjoyed this video and it helps you get your, uh, your Cave Dweller Savages painted up.